evening and welcome to Reba. I was just um, turning to another speaker at the front of the room and looking back and saying how great it was to see a younger audience, to see students who are interested in this topic this evening. So thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. I'm Helen Castle, Publishing Director at Reba, and I oversee the publishing department, which includes the Reba Journal, book publishing, the bookshop, the job board, and sponsorship. Thank you for joining us for this second talk in the Reba and Vitra autumn season, Wellbeing, Wellbuilt. The talk series explores how architects and designers can shape the environments and spaces we inhabit, creating places that enhance our sense of well-being, both physically and mentally. This season is part of our ongoing partnership with Vitra Bathrooms, and I'd like to say a very special thank you to Vitra for sponsoring the programme. It's enabled us to explore innovative ideas about the way society is rethinking the relationship between the built environment and our physical and mental health. The buildings and external spaces we inhabit influence and impact our behaviour and our relationships, how we interact with one another, as well as our emotions and physical health. For architects and designers, it goes beyond the mere functionality. Details and features have the potential to create places that lift and boost our mood and improve the quality of how we connect with, another, with one another. The talk series responds to topical and pressing issues by showcasing projects by architects and designers working to develop physical digital and societal infrastructures to engender healthier living. Topics to be discussed in future talks include the importance of colour and the impact of nature and green spaces within the built environment. And the season concludes with a significant keynote from Carlos Moreno on his vision for the 15-minute city. Today, though, we're focusing on designing spaces for those with dementia. We have a terrific lineup of speakers who are going to share their work and expertise, exploring what a safe, sensitive space might look like to those with dementia. Dementia is a condition that is on the rise, impacting greater numbers as the population ages and people live longer. According to the Alzheimer's Society, in 2019, there were around 900,000 people living with dementia in the UK. Architects can play a pivotal role in supporting and enhancing the lives of those living with dementia by creating environments that facilitate a supportive and caring community, providing stability and connection to those whose sense of self is progressively disintegrating. Joining us this evening to explore this important subject, we have Frank Van Dillen, founder of DVA, Dementia Village Associates. Frank, who's just flown over from Amsterdam this afternoon to be with us, is an architect and entrepreneur engaged in social business case systems for elderly care. He's been involved in designing and consulting over 70 elderly and dementia village projects in and outside of the Netherlands. Frank will present the very first dementia village in the Holkwijk in the Netherlands, a neighborhood designed for those living with dementia. The approach has humanized the care of those diagnosed with dementia, revolutionizing the traditional structure of a nursing home, creating a more supportive and independent environment for its residents. Our final presentation for the evening is from architects Neil McLaughlin and Yeria Manolopoulou. Neil McLaughlin is founder of the award-winning Neil McLaughlin Architects and Professor of Architectural Practice at the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL. Yuria Manolopoulou is co-founder of AY Architects and Professor of Architecture and Experimental Practice at the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL. Neil and Yuria um, collaborated on a project called Losing Myself for the 15th Venice Architecture Biennale. Their installation featured a time-based drawing which represented the plan of a building as it may be experienced by different people with dementia. 
After these presentations, our speakers will be joined in conversation by Claire Cameron, um, who is an architect and director within the Later Living team at PRP. She has an in-depth knowledge of nursing care, dementia care, assisted living and extra care sheltered housing, having designed and led an extensive portfolio of award-winning projects in the field of older people, housing and care. Now, I'm very happy to pass you over to Claire. Claire Cameron is going to be the chair of the panel at the end, but first she's going to just introduce herself and PRP, and after that, uh, we're going to have our first presentation from Frank Van Dillen. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to share a room with so many people that have an interest in dementia, um, like we do, uh, myself and the speakers here. We're here to talk about inclusive environments and discuss what safe, sensitive spaces look like for those with dementia. As Helen has said, I'm an architect and a director in our Later Living team at PRP. Our passion is all about designing beautiful buildings, buildings which are homely as well as being enabling. The emphasis is on homely, as opposed to just being institutional and purely functional, which, if I'm honest, some of our clients might lead us towards if, we, if we're not engaged and careful. Our aim is for all older people to be able to retain a sense of purpose and enjoy meaningful lives in the buildings that we design. In Design for Dementia, we believe that residents should be provided with spaces and opportunities to safely carry on doing the things that are important to them in their lifestyle. The emphasis is on personal lifestyle, whether that be carrying on working, looking after children, gardening, cooking, enjoying music, whatever it is that means they can maintain the lifestyle that they are used to. The benefits of this is maintaining a sense of purpose and therefore benefits in health and well-being. Frank, I've met your wonderful ex-colleagues, Eloy and Yannette, when designing a new care home recently. And we shared a lot of values, and, but they certainly challenged us, our brief, our clients, and our design concepts. So I know that you're going to bring some enlightening uh, information to the room today. Neil and your year, I'm sure everyone in the room is itching to see what your slightly scary-looking quad pod is all about. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing that. And after our presentations, I look forward to a nice discussion. Thank you. I'll hand over to you, Frank. Well, thank you all for this opportunity, and especially Reba and Vitra. Um, <clears throat> my name is Frank, Frank van Dillen. I'm a, I'm a professional architect, but I sold my architectural firm about two years ago. Um, my architectural firm was always a little bit peculiar because <clears throat> we ask every client of us why, why, why? Why are you doing it like this? Um, and the last two, three years, I'm a dedicated consultant for DVA, uh, DVA Dementia Village Associates, uh, together with partners. Um, and I also have experience in Holland uh, with my own firm where I am an so, uh, social developer of new housing concept for the elderly. Um, as told, I have 25 years of experience of over 70 uh, elderly care homes. Um, but not all that special like the Hogewijk. I will tell, of course, a little bit more about that. Um, this is what we do with DVA, together with my partners, uh, and we our consultants and also give keynote lectures. That is not that important. What important is this? Aging is not a disease, but a way of life and a stage of life. And that is very important because we always challenge all organizations in the why. And it's about quality of life. And DVA, Dementia Village, is a little bit also not the quite uh, the, the name which is um, um, how can I say that that we we like to say the whole world is like a dementia village and it's because of all of us here in this as an audience but also I, myself my son for instance have all special needs and it's about quality of life dementia dementia is not upfront like my arthrosis, arthritis, is not upfront. Like 
my deaf son, his deafness, deafness is not upfront, but the quality of life is upfront. And that, as a designers, we have to challenge that kind of questions. Uh, so living, working, recreation, and social inclusion is paramount in this. Um, a partner of mine, Frank Lapre, um, and we are both uh, members of the European Aging Network and ECREAS, and that's a, a knowledge center of, uh, of the European Aging Network. Um, he was the main author of this report, a report on long-term care. Um, and that is very important. It's, it's right, it, it is um, spread all around Europe, and it is, um, yeah, it's, it's also ver for very importance of England and the UK. Um, and the report conclusions are those. Governments are in denial. And we already knew for 30, 40 years that a very grey audience is coming to our, uh, toward us. But governments are still in denial. Um, a business sometimes is failing. Of course, not Fitra, but other businesses are failing to addressing the needs of all the, uh, the elderly people. Um, and the aged care sector itself uh, relaxes, uh, lay back, and say, OK, the government will solve this, but they won't. And we, as society, overall faces the threats of social cohesion. And that is very, uh, very important. And that is also what we, as architects, can do. Let me give you a brief, a very, very, very brief uh, history on dementia care developments. Uh, two, three hundred years ago, it was taking care informal, private and monasteries, for instance. Um, and there was, I guess, 30, 40 years ago, there was an awareness, a demand for cost efficiency, logistics and scaling up. And that is where we lost our, not clients, not patients, but our residents with uh, dementia. It, the outcome is an economic solution. And with the Hogewijk, about 20 years ago, we had awareness number two. There is a demand for adaptive and small-scale nursing homes and very big paradigm shifts. So the outcome has to be a holistic and social inclusion. And that is what we are all aiming for. And we need paradigm shifts from care to prevention and inclusion. From institute to redefine home. You can read it all. Only professional to family and co-creation. Very important. Medical focus, no, a social approach. One size fits all to lifestyle orientated. System dominance care organizations to client focus and staff density to, smart, uh, to staff and smart technology. And I didn't tell you, of, uh, th this is not, um, this questions all architects here in the audience should challenge and should ask the organizations and should ask yourself, um, and what can we do? This is the traditional nursing home. It's a medical model, medical approach, no attention of no connection to the outside world and to the real world, for instance. Wards with 15 to 20 patients, we still call them patients in this kind of facilities. No innovati innovative built environment and do what you always do did. So organizational convenience and no personal center care, one size fits all. With the Hogewijk, I'll come up to that later, uh, we did already a next step. And remember, it was a vision on uh, small-scale housing, lifestyle oriented about, uh, we started the design in 2002, but it was already 10 years before that that they experimented with that kind of ideas and that kind of vision. So the Hogewijk, which is still very important outside the Netherlands, I can't tell it uh, uh, on, uh, I can't tell it any, uh, any other, other way. Other way. Um, but it is already a concept and a vision of about 25, 30 years old. Uh, but it's very important as 
the next level of nursing homes and uh, dementia care. It's small scale living, uh, lifestyle orientated, supporting the elderly on site and semi open social hubs. Come up to that later. But it is still 24 hours nursing and care. Um, and diagnosis and treatment in the residential care center and the possibility at home, to give them at home. Um, we all know what the progression of cognitive disorders by stages of dementia is, more or less. Stage one is how we are sitting here. Not me, not myself, I have Alzheimer's light, of course. Everybody has some, uh, some problems, but stage one is the common, uh, the common outside world. But then it comes to stage two, three, four, five, six, seven. And two, three, and four is more, is independent and assistant living um, with or without home care, family support, and support convenience. But in between four and five, gets confused, not only for the residents, but also for the designers and the architects. And that is where the architects and designers can make a difference between and from four, five, six, and seven. Because then dementia takes over. Confusion um, and making uh, makes no sense for the, for, for the residents is become upfront. Forgetting the past and at the end the body shuts down and people are going to die from dementia. Um, we translated that in six design principles. Lifestyle approach, recognizable environment, safe built environment, and keep in touch with daily life and social, of, social hubs, the values of life. And at home with supportive technique. These are the pillars. And together, together with the organization, the challenge of the organization we did, uh, is the outcome is a living environment, a holistic, living, social, inclusive environment. <clears throat> Lifestyle. It's a, it's a discussion all over the world. What is lifestyle? It's not, I repeat, it's not about segregation or good or bad, but it is about norms and values which are the basis of you and my life. It's, of course, well known that residents with dementia go back about 20 years ago with their norms, norms and values. So we have to challenge and address that kind of design uh, principles. And living according lifestyle validates you and me as a person. We are here. Have, have the same interest, the same interest is coming over here, but when we go home, we have different friends, we go to different restaurants, we have d different hobbies, etc. But here together, we are, are more or less like-minded. <clears throat> and that is lifestyle. <clears throat> lifestyle is what you eat, what you read, what religion, very discussable, but in France, for instance, we can't pronounce or we can't uh, address religion, uh, but it's social behavior and how you communicate. And lifestyle is about surroundings, environment, landscaping. And lifestyle is what we are and what you are. Um, on top, the socio demographics are the same of Arnold and Michael. They are both 70 plus, earn a lot of money. Uh, live in the US, are both actor and director and male. So you can sit next to each other and they are the same. But the norms and values, and it's not, again, it's not about good or bad or segregation, but the norms and values are different as the norms and values of our, of here, our audience is different. Is different. So this is um, the principle of lifestyle. Number two, recognizable. I think architecture can, uh, can be harmful in many ways. This is not how you go to bath in bath or have a shower or um, um, go to what can be distressful, uh, stressful as a, as a dementia resident. But 
they, um, for me, it's uh, not real, and it's it would be. It, it's not what you want. Is this what you want in your own bathroom? Perhaps one or two here in the audience, but the mainstream audience not. It's not your bathroom. It's the confusion. It's more. It's more confusing. Uh, what the, uh, in this size. Um, recognizable. Um, I flip two. I go here first for this one. This is more or less the same. When I have dementia and I'm not um, seeing that well, I have a yellow glaze about my, in my eyes. Then I come around the corner, and at the end of the corner, I see a man sitting on a bench. I go to that bench. I want to sit down, break my hip, go dead. So this is not real. People with dementia don't know what a parking space is for their relators, for their walking uh, walkers. So this is uh, more confusing than when you do it real and make a real um, living and um, uh, environment. Um, this is also covered. Uh, there was a, a big discussion uh, about the Hogewijk, Hogewijk, you say, <laughs> um, uh, of covered hallways. People with dementia are not crazy. They know when it's raining. They know when the snow, snow is uh, on the path. They one or two maybe from the 150 residents, but they know exactly what to do because that is imprinted in their mind. They know exactly what to do. So when you do it like this, you design like this, you have more confusion in my and in our opinion. Um, what we did at the Hogewijk is a safe and um, uh, yeah, a, safe, uh, a safe outside world. Um, it is about 23, 25 houses of six, seven residents in one house. Um, you saw the 3D picture. This is the Hogewijk, with, you could, could say, a gated community, a gated wall around it. Um, there was a, a big discussion also at, uh, at the beginning, at the start of the, uh, the, this design principle, uh, to open up more and not agree, the green arrow, but open up more than that only green error, uh, arrow uh, to the outside. But that was at 2000, 2001, it was too much at that point of the, of the organization. But now we reflected on it and we say, okay, we can open up much more because of also the technique is more, uh, is more evolved. But the resident can go outside and via the rain and via the gardens and via the architecture uh, and reflects on what they know. They have a big square at the middle, uh, small gardens, but also at the, at the beginning a theater, a theater square, uh, supermarket, etc. So what we did is how we ask ourselves and the organization every time the question, how would you like it at home? Why, when you have dementia, you would design something else as a normal living environment? So there was a parad paradigm shift in instead of choices. It's not a hospital, it's about hospitality. And to, to rethink all of those items, which we all know, to make a big storage room because of that, because we need that to make uh, shiny hallways with physiotherapists, uh, because we always did. Um, but the instead of choices, and that is very important to uh, to uh, to underline, um, were instead of choices with the same money, with the same budget. Um, for instance, the supermarket, everybody sees the Hogewijk, sees a supermarket. But we designed the storage room and the logistic system as a supermarket. And the outcome was, 
the residents go to the supermarket, they recognize the supermarket, they had a freedom of choice of doing the groceries and doing their, their shopping. Uh, there were two, unfortunately, but in favor of the residents, there were two uh, personnel less on the logistic system because of the residents, they took their groceries back to home. The logistic system was minimized. And it was with the same budget, the same money, um, we changed uh, two uh, uh, um, full-time equivalents and we, um, we designed that in square meters. Also, the physiotherapist, for instance, on the lower right. When you design an outside environment where people are challenged to go outside and where people uh, are challenged to, to wander around, you don't have to have a dedicated physiotherapist room. What you need is one or two physiotherapists who, co who come to their house and help the caregivers to support people in standing up from their chair and going outside. So you could say it is an organizational level, but as an architect, you have to challenge that and you can make the difference. So take no, um, uh, no, no, no for that answer and say we can do it on the other way. Life pleasures, social hubs. Um, what we also see is that our, there are multifunctional rooms. But people with dementia, when they go to a multifunctional room and they listen to music, they have a beer or they are painting or uh, do, do some, uh, some small uh, uh, pastry uh, baking. Um, when that is a multifunctional room, then it's confusing. When you do small social hubs where you have that dedicated uh, activities, um, it is more... Uh, less stressful for the people with dementia. So that is a restaurant and a bar designed as a restaurant and a bar. Also open for the outside, the, the, the outside environment for the people who live nearby. But also it is very interesting and very good for sons, daughters and family members. I like to come over and sit with my father and have a beer instead of in smelly hallways um, have a drink which I don't know if that kind of environment is the right environment. Um, small scale housing, favorable surrounding. The small scale housing are more or less 25 different housing from six to s up to seven residents in one house, lifestyle orientated. I explained lifestyle because um, in one house, there is one lifestyle. Um, I like to, I'm sorry. I like to hear the Rolling Stones, and he likes to hear classical music. And when we sit ne next to each other, I get angry because he is every time putting on the, uh, the remote control on classical music. And then I get angry. So if... I'm sorry? <laughs> but... Uh, we come up to that later. <laughs> um, so that is lifestyle. So what we did, we designed uh, different places to sit and to, um, to relax. Um, but lifestyle is also about the food you eat. I explained that already. What you see here is that we uh, didn't design a bathroom en suite. That is one of the things um, nowadays we advise to do. You can... Let me do one sidestep. We didn't uh, design the bathroom en suite on, uh, on, this, um, on all those plans because those square meters we took in favor for the living environment. And when you have dementia, you can't go by yourself to a bathroom. So private bathroom is always supported by a nurse. So on dementia level, you could say, this is very good. But when you talk to families, my father and mother has to have a bathroom en suite because that is private. Okay. 
Um, and it's evidence-based. It's common sense, but it's also evidence-based. It's a high satisfaction on residents and family. Um, let me show you some pictures. This is the entrance. And the lady um, on the right, she knows more or less every resident and knows if they can go out with supported family. That's no problem. But if not, they get turned around and go back to uh, the Hogewijk, to, to the safe environment. This is the supermarket, theater square. You don't have to be afraid of water and ponds because people with dementia are not crazy. They don't drown, it's no problem. It's good to do. This is one of the hobbies, a dedicated music room, classical music room. So it doesn't confuse people. When they go out to listen music, they know exactly this is a classical music room. And then, as an architect, you have to do perhaps a step back. It doesn't mean have to be gray and white and black. You have to design that or let loose and let the, uh, the, 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 uh, the volunteers design that kind of uh, uh, rooms. Outside activities, make your own choices. This is a dedicated shed built for that, that man. He passed away already. This is a picture of uh, a photograph of uh, two, uh, a few years ago. And you could uh, say as an architect, it's not very architectural, but it is how people live. So if you provide a good environment where all this kind of things can happen, there is no problem. And of course, as an architect, we did take the outline and we make, made um, uh, the, the boundaries for everything else, but then let loose. And they go with a bike, not only in the safe Hogewijk community, but also outside. So the results are, already mentioned, high satis satisfaction among residents and family. Positive effects on the residents, on the employees, and positive ex effects in care. And decrease in aggression by an increase of fresh air, exercise, daylight, freedom, etc. Um, and this is what we think, and I think, architects have to support. It's, the architecture is not upfront, but it's supportive on the care of dementia. What can be the next step? That is, tear down the walls of the nursing homes. Make a complete, inclusive, open community. Dementia care in the neighborhood, a more social approach, and no recognizable nursing home anymore. Perhaps high care, small dedicated, uh, uh, small dedicated centers. Um, support all generations, make a mix of generations, because we challenge the next few 10 years uh, a lack of employees, and it's doubling on dementia and on elderly care. So we have a real challenge. Um, use e-health, 24 hour, uh, hours nursing and care at home as possible. But of course, we saw the stages, there has to be a dedicated small scale unit, but not that big as we all think that is needed. And social hubs, more open and uh, for, for everybody. This is already more open. It's more or less a, an, an Hogewijk model, but um, it's, um, it's, all, um, it's all surrounded with normal houses, social housing for uh, also the elderly. And it's, that are the white spots uh, on the left. This is in Holland, in Heerenveen, in the north of Holland. 
We did that with my fo uh, former uh, firm, architectural firm, Bureau Kader. And this is in Berlin. And this is also a nursing home. And the nursing home, uh, do I have a pointer? Yes, I have a pointer. This is all normal housing in the, sur in the suburbs of Berlin. And here we designed a nursing home on this spot on, uh, with an open air uh, swimming pool. We translated to the German environment and the German legislation, and that is why we have to, had to make one building. But we did it with connections with green roofs and, uh, and terraces, etc. So it looks like different housing, but about, uh, because of the legislations, we have to make one continuum of building. Well, thank you for your attention. I'm Neil McLaughlin, and this is your year, Manalapulu. Um, we taught together for 20 years, and we did a collaboration for a project called Losing Myself for the Venice Biennale in 2016. I want to just continue on from um, Frank's uh, speech to say that um, the problem about designing and managing environments for people with dementia is not to take care of their safety, it's to allow them to live and die a spiritually meaningful way. And um, that's what we should focus on when we're thinking about it. Um, I watched a television program about Jack Charlton, the famous footballer and football coach. He won the World Cup with England in 66, and in 92, I think he got Ireland as a manager to the quarterfinals of the World Cup. It was a terrific documentary. He has dementia now. Um, they spoke to people about his whole career, but one person they spoke to was Paul McGrath, who was a troubled child playing for Manchester United. Um, he was in real trouble with the team. He was picked for Ireland by Jack Charlton. And Jack somehow found something in him, got something out of him, and turned him into a star who scored a goal in the quarterfinal for Ireland. And uh, Paul McGrath said, I don't know what I would have done if it wasn't for Jack. In the documentary at the end, in this still, they say to Jack, do you remember winning the World Cup with England? No. Do you remember getting to the quarterfinals with Ireland? No. And then they said, do you remember Paul McGrath? He said, he was some. <laughs> what I love about that is that the bit of him that was given over to caring was still able to hold on to that thing. The bit of him that was a mentor was still able to hold on to that thing. We were asked in 1999 to design a daycare and respite center for the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. This is Helen Rushford Brennan, who, will, who your year will speak about later who's a great advocate for people with dementia. She has early onset dementia, um, and uh, she's part of the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. They gave me the most amazing brief for an architect. They said, we know nothing about architecture, and you know nothing about dementia. So we'll teach you about dementia, and you teach us about architecture. And we did that for 10 years together as we built the building. And it was an absolutely wonderful working relationship. And what was great about the um, job was that they asked us to come in and spend as much time as we could in the center. And when you went in there, you had a group of volunteers. It was a secular organization working with some retired religious nuns uh, who, who ran the center in an old primary school. And they um, believed that the whole community of people in the building um, were, part of the, uh, uh, were, 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 were part of the project. And they did something that I found really fascinating. I, I would go in and just spend time with people, chatting to them and getting a feeling for the world that they were inhabiting. But they tell a curious and very interesting white lie, which is that if you come in with um, an, a diagnosis of dementia or you have concern about dementia and you want some counseling, one of the things they say to you is, would you like to come in here and volunteer for a while and get a feel for what it's like, for what this world is like, and to give you some sense of um, a better understanding of the situation. So people would come in and volunteer, 
But the curious thing is, as their dementia developed, everybody continued to believe that they were volunteers. So when you went into the center, you didn't have a relationship between people who were passively being cared for and people who were actively caring, but you had a sense of a community of people who were all taking care of each other. And the shift in dynamic, I thought, was really extraordinary. One of the things about to mention, these are diagrams from Tom Kitwood's book, and he talks about the sort of um, kind of desperation of the progress of dementia. I'm going to show you two diagrams. Both of them end in death at the center. And you can see here the movement from normal life at the top left, that incident getting lost, a further decline, the diagnosis, problems of continence, the failure of daycare, the incident with the nurses, the admission to residential care, and the spiral goes through to malnutrition, vegetation, and death. And what Tom Kitwood says is, it doesn't need to be like that. And the thing that would make it unlike that would be a caring community. And he then talks about the, the, the way in which a community of people can hold somebody up when their mental powers are declining. It still ends in the top right with death, but the way in which it progresses is completely different because you, their, their personhood is being held up by the community around them. Now, as an architect thinking about that, I wanted to think, first of all, about what it is that we mean by space, because we all use the word all the time, but what do we actually mean by it? And I thought a good definition to work with in relation to this was that it's somehow the realm of action. It's the possibility that we have to act at any time or to imagine any set of actions at any time. And what I want to do is just take you through a collection of Paul Clay's drawings and talk about how we develop and change our sense of space over time. It might be the case that a child, when they're newborn, doesn't actually know that it's not their mother. Um, they may believe that they're the same body, but the space opens up between the mother and the child, and that's the space of negotiation. It's a space of tenderness, but also permissions, desires, and taboos. So space is never a neutral thing. The space that the child has is already infected in all sorts of ways uh, and uh, con constitutes the core of their personality. As they begin to get up and wander around the room and meet other people, there's a sense in which they extend out. They can stand and move and, and feel, feel their way through space. And so the spatial realm begins to extend. But all the time, it's never innocently acquired. It's always acquired as part of a social milieu. And as, as people grow and develop and become more active and more able to constitute themselves in space, um, the sense of the relationship between a person's personality and the space which they have acquired and internalized and inhabited is extremely important. And the more complex our lives become, the more complex the tasks of navigation are. It's always this relationship between the person, the deep sense of their self, and the space that they occupy. And all of us imagine some high point in our lives when we're at our most able. But even now, for me, I can feel myself beginning to decline. There's a sense that my peripheral vision is beginning to go. My sense that I'm able to move around in spaces in the way that I used to is beginning to erode. That changes the space. My, my own idea of what space is is beginning to change because of that. And one of the things that we can do as we grow, grow older is hold on to communities and mementos and objects and things that we care for to sort of hold up and to shore up the sense of the relationship between the space which we think of as being our world and a deeper idea of our own personality. And one of the tragedies, I think, of dementia is it begins to sort of tear that apart in some way. It begins to rip it apart. I'm using these drawings. I don't know if you know Paul Clay's history, but he uh, had failing eyesight, and his painting changed quite a bit as he grew older. Um, and bit by bit, that sense of um, the connections that we put together that create the sense of space, which is so close to our identity, begins to erode, and we lose the sense that we're of, 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 of what we are in ourselves. It comes with an almost complete erosion of the individual. And I always feel it's like these uh, great ice sheets that break up into icebergs, and they become more and more disconnected. And you have these fragments that float in a way that fails to cohere anymore. It must be the most distressing and alarming state. But one thing that we can do, once again, is to think about the way in which the space is constructed by a caring community. Space is not just something that belongs to the individual, but, be, but can be collectively constructed in the social realm. And people can take care of each other and hold on to the personhood of the other person and allow them to, 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 to thrive right up until the end of their lives. So thinking about Paul Clay and reading about his essays and so on, I began to think about um, the German uh, thinkers who he had been influenced by from the late 19th century who were constituting the idea of what space is. And uh, particularly this idea of empathy and space, that somehow our way that we project ourselves out into space and understand space always has to come back to some innate sense 
of our own bodies and who we are in ourselves. And developing from that, I did a lot of work looking at the brain and trying to understand the neurological underpinning of our sense of space. And of course, it seems quite natural that we're here in a room, we're looking at each other, I'm me, you're you, we've all got that worked out. But actually, in a way, it's a fully transparent representation. What's actually happening is that a complex set of electrical signals are coming through my ears, through my eyes, through my sense of touch. They're going, first of all, to the sensory cortices, where they're being processed. Second levels of information are then cascading down to deeper parts of the brain, where that comes as pure information, not as light or sound or anything else, but pure electronic information. And in these parts at the heart of the, of the brain, called the hippocampus and the areas around it, you get this reintegration where all of that, both our sense of time and our sense of space, is integrated in a way, in a framework or a matrix that allows us to create coherence. And the tragedy of dementia is that the pathology of the disease tends to start in and around the hippocampus and to move out to the outer cortices. So that sense of coherence, what um, the neuroscientists call the stage set that allows everything else that we are to cohere, begins to drift apart. Um, and one of the things that we did on the back of that was to speak to neuroscientists at UCL who have done these extraordinary experiments about how the brain actually computes the sense of space. The, 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 the work they've done on this is absolutely amazing. Um, finding out there are all these different cells uh, which give us a sense of where we are in space. Place cells, grid cells, boundary vector cells that create a sense of space. And one of the, the this is diagrams which were done um, by Kate Jeffries, or made by Kate Jeffries, where she's doing experiments um, in the lab and discovering that um, rats moving around in a box over time, um, every time their place cells or their grid cells trigger, um, a little dot appears, and over time this pattern develops, which is almost like a grid which is thrown over the space. So there's this innate deep mapping function in the brain uh, which, which gives, gives us a sense of, co of, co of, co of coherence. Now, uh, alongside those more theoretical um, investigations, uh, in London we were also doing feasibility studies for London Borough of Camden, talking to people who had dementia, their carers and their families, and speaking to them about what they wanted from a caring environment. And one of the things that we did as a practice was to ask people with dementia to take photographs of their homes. And we then brought the photographs into a workshop, and everybody picked their favorite photographs and we collated those and we turned them into postcards. And on the back of the postcard, we had Dear Architect. And we asked people to write to us uh, and just to share what they wanted. And some people said, I want, I love light and color and the things that you might expect. But a lot of people confided things that were really troubling and very deep and central to a huge anxiety that they had about the changing nature of their being at that time. So it was a very valuable project. And we worked with them over a period of, uh, a, 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 o, o, over a year, just thinking about what the ideal environment would be for them and asking them questions about what they wanted. And we created a book called What You Told Us. And the purpose of the book was not to produce any new knowledge from our side, but simply to put down with illustrations everything that they had said that they wanted from a caring environment. And I can't go through all of these in detail, but you can see on the, on, on the pages that we produced that, um, um, that, there were, that, there were, that, there, that there were different desires and opportunities that they were expressing. I really liked that, this garden. I showed it to a landscape architect, and they said it's absolutely terrible. And I said, it's got one of everything that everybody wants. What do you expect it to be? Um, <laughs> but um, it was this idea that you would put all of that down so that, you could, so that they could communicate on their own behalf what it was that they were looking for. And we were, in a sense, just the, just the voice or the pen, pencil that was drawing that and putting it down in a way that they could agree to it and then communicate it on to other people. But when we came back to Dublin to try and design the, the care center for dementia, the thing that I wanted to do was to say, well, how do I take all of this abstract knowledge and lay it open to architecture? What does an architect do to mint that or to give it currency as architecture? And I had to try and think, given what I've found out about this condition, what buildings do I know that would allow me to feel located and situated in time and space, given that my sense of the world is fragmenting. And I just went back to my own experiences of walking through Louis Barragan's house in Mexico City and going out a room out, leaving a room out one door and coming back 20 minutes later and find I'm in the same room again. This sense of wandering and what I started to call a continuous present tense, that you can wander and each room looks onto a different garden. And then looking at the plan of that and trying to understand it. And then thinking about the Schindler house, which has got the same quality and plan, 
where as you wander around the house, you're looking into different garden spaces, but you always wander back to the place that you started, having seen all of these different gardens on the way. And then this is a sense that you have in, in, in the Schindler House in, 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 in Los Angeles of looking out into those garden spaces. And finally, the most beautiful plan of Mies van der Rohe's brick country house. And it's got that same quality that you could walk around from room to room and find yourself discovering new spaces and new views. But you would always bring yourself back to the still center, which I thought was a beautiful opportunity for a plan. So these are the photographs that we took of the building that were finished. I want to talk about that in a minute. But this is the plan of the building. And you can see maybe the DNA of lots of those other plans in it. And one of the things we were thinking is that there's a central room here, which is the social center of the development. And anybody who wants to wander away, because wandering is a habit for people with dementia, some people with dementia, anybody who wants to wander away will find themselves moving through a sequence of rooms or gardens, but they will always return back to that central place, that center of sociability. So it's both centripetal and centrifugal. And each of the gardens on the perimeter, the garden in the west is an orchard, the garden in the southeast is an afternoon garden. The east garden is to do at the dining room and breakfast. The north garden is for the offices. So that each of these gardens have got different smells and scents. And as you wander around in that sense of continuous unspooling, that there's always something to lead you on and to, and, 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 and to make you feel situated. And just to take, take out of that then the sense of wandering in those gardens to take the walls away from it. So this is the building as it was finished. And I think one of the difficulties we had, and this photograph points to it more than anything else, is that the amateur organization who we designed it for was taken over by the HSE, which is like the NHS. And they completely professionalized the care and to a significant extent medicalized it. I don't know who would put sofas like that into a home for older people. They're absolutely hopeless. You slope back in the chair. You've no head support. Whoever put those in had no understanding of the needs of older people. But this room here, which we call the quiet room, which could also be used as a chapel, we understood that in a secular country that most people who with dementia who are older are actually still deeply religious, was going to be under this tree. They turned it into a storeroom and cut down the tree because it didn't have a kind of a meaning in relation to their idea of managed care. This is another house I designed that I wanted it to be like this, and this is what I dreamt that it would be like. And I always felt a great sense of loss that the building that we designed never became like that. And in a sense, what Yuri and I did, did, did later was a way to try and deal with and recover that loss. This was a drawing we made saying this is what we dreamt the building would be like in its setting with its different gardens and rooms opening out into it and that sense of a continuous present. So when we were asked to, uh, to exhibit at Venice, we went to the room in the Biennale and just looked, took photographs of the funny uh, factory space with its pieces of conduit on the walls and its kind of ramshackle air and this kind of rather gorgeous roof in it, which you couldn't hang anything from. And from that, I love these kind of pieces of truncated conduit that were part of the history of the building. And from that, we decided that we would make a series of drawings that were about taking all of those things and using them to project a drawing on the floor. So this is the idea of the drawing on the floor. Uh, and that drawing on the floor would somehow explain or talk about all of the ideas that we were trying to bring together around the subject of dementia. Losing myself was centered on collaboration. It would have not been possible without learning from others, without constant dialogue, and without drawing together between the two of us, but also with others. As architects, we simply do not know enough about dementia. So for us, engaging in dialogue was a necessity, not simply a choice. We traveled up and down in Ireland and the UK to meet experts in the field. Dialogue allows us to include in our perspectives as architects the perspectives of others. We had conversations with families who have loved ones living with dementia, with healthcare managers, with health policy experts and dementia design experts, with neuroscientists and anthropologists. Helen Rochford Brennan, who Neil referred to earlier, was diagnosed with younger onset Alzheimer's at 61. And this is an extract of what she said to us. So I've been struggling for a number of years with memory issues, and I wasn't quite sure what was happening to me. And 
every time I told somebody that I thought I had a problem with my memory, they told me I was doing too much because I was also, at that stage, uh, when I was diagnosed, I was chair of a state board, Western Development Commission. But I found myself at meetings and I lose the word, I lose the sentence, and it's there, but I just can't reach it, you know. And so I found that extraordinarily difficult and I found it rather difficult for the people that were watching me because the words just wouldn't come. Over time, I just knew there's something, you know, every day of work, I had the in-tray, and I, it seemed to be always there. Couldn't move my in-tray to get it off my desk. I used to go to work in the morning and think, you know, it, they were so simple, why can't I deal with them? I went to doctors, and one said yes, and one said no, as, as happens, and uh, eventually I was diagnosed. I resigned four years ago. I knew myself, I could no longer do my job. So after losing my job, then you lose everything. You know, because your job goes, then I had to step down from the chair board, then I had to step down from the chamber, then I had to step down from loads of committees that I sat on. And then you have nothing. You have four walls. I was over 65. Helen's despair uh, was lightened only when a nurse suggested to her to become involved in dementia research and in campaigning. And when we met her, she was vice chair of the European Working Group of People with Dementia and also chair of the uh, corresponding uh, Irish group. We are very lucky to have met and have multiple conversations with the neuropsychologist Sebastian Kratz at UCL, who introduced us to the work of William Uttermolen. Uttermolen was an American artist who received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, like Helen, also at the age of 61. As his dementia worsened, Uther Molen did not stop painting. The self-portraits that he did during this period are in themselves exceptional art pieces, but they also offer a glimpse to us into the artist's experience of his progression of Alzheimer's. Here the artist paints himself looking at his mirror image on the left, while the painting has also distorted perspectival angles. In this painting, he removes again from others, showing himself alone with his cat on the sofa. He paints an attic above his head that did not actually exist in his house, and he surrounds himself with objects and events around him that have happened at different times, all these scenes colliding into the same frame. As the artist's Alzheimer's disease was progressing, his spatial and visual skills were declining. The self-portrait that we see here captures a sense of holding tight onto the furniture in an effort to find stability, perhaps, and he's alone. With diminishing communication ability, loneliness increases. His heartbreaking portraits reveal a human mind that tries to comprehend itself while experiencing frightening change and decline in cognitive skills. This drawing was done about three years later. He depicts his body fragmented and confused, and the world around the body has now lost detail and color. This is his last recognizable self-portrait, which shows a split in the two sides of the face, evoking total suffering. Sebastian Kratz and his team at the UCL Dementia Research Center have also conducted art workshops where people with dementia were asked to paint the same set of objects. These four paintings on the screen do not seem like it, but they represent the same set of objects. They were painted by people living with dementia who chose to depict these objects entirely differently. The experience of dementia is not only constantly changing for any individual, but it is also felt uniquely differently by each individual. And this is, of course, an enormous challenge for all of us uh, as architects and as a society. The tragedy of dementia is that the brain is hidden. We cannot see how the brain works. How does the human mind create an understanding of space? So we spoke with the anthropologist Tim Ingold, who argued that the human mind constructs stories to interlink memory with space and time. So we know where we are and remember where we are because we can tell a story about the place we find ourselves in. 
And to a certain extent, Ingold questioned the neuroscientist approach. Kate Jeffrey, um, who Neil referred to earlier, so does this image of grid cells forming a hexagonal geometry in the brain and told us that essentially these grid cells create internal maps in our brains. But for Ingold, memory is an action. It is, it is something that we do. It is not an image that we passively retrieve from the brain. These different and at, at times contradictory perspectives are podcasts on the Losing Myself website. Our graphic designers, Objective, uh, came with us to UCL, to the UCL Dementia Center workshop to test the design of the website with patients who have posterior cortical atrophy, a form of dementia. And these signs that you see on the left had to be adjusted so that, for example, no, no sign used on the website could have the same directionality as this would be confusing for people. Complex web navigation with multiple steps was also questioned, and so our website has an everything page where each item can be as accessed by one click. So the website contains the podcast, short ordinary stories, anecdotes about people living with dementia, as well as a diary of our full research and drawing process. In Losing Myself, our collaboration extended beyond us to involve other architects. We invited them to participate in the project and to draw together with us as protagonists. I mean, all of us as protagonists, rather than the two of us. The drawing hands here embody 16 inhabitants of the Orchard Centre as they occupy parts of the building. The architects and acting occupants of the building were asked to draw fragments of the plan because they cannot hold its totality in their minds. As the day passes, multiple drawings would accumulate and assemble a new and collective understanding of the building, which may question the original architectural plan. We wanted to let off control so that others could draw freely in a process that was maybe uncertain but also empowering for the individuals. Here I'm drawing on trace on a glass surface while the camera is recording me from below. This was one of the first drawing experiments we did um, as we tried to capture the presence of human consciousness in the drawing. This was the setup for these uh, experiments where you see the camera below the, the glass. Neil and I did many drawings trying to figure out how exactly we should draw. This was the first drawing we did when we made the hypothesis that we should draw in a continuous line, very much in, in class spirit, as if we take the line for a walk, as if there is a flow and continuity of consciousness. We agreed that the line would not stand for where the body will move in space, but where their mind would wander. Our drawing room, we made special desks with glass tops and a special base below that held small video cameras. We used black ink pens to, to draw and ask our colleagues to position themselves in an imagined location in the building at a particular time and to draw freely as if they perceive and occupy the space. We created architectural scores, just like a, score, a musician would score a performance, to determine who would draw which part of the building and at what time exactly. Essentially, we wanted to redraw the building not as originally designed and built, but as lived and experienced collectively by its occupants over a 24-hour period. The original plan, with its bedrooms, corridors, and social spaces that Neil showed earlier, was slightly adjusted to match a grid of 64 A1 sections for drawing. This grid helped us to locate its drafter inside the building, who drew that part of the plan for up to half an hour before moving on to another part of the building and another part of the plan. The color frames here stand for different sequences of spaces occupied by different individuals. So, for example, the blue frames represent a sequence of spaces from the bedroom to the external gardens as potentially experienced by the same inhabitant. And each color is a different inhabitant. 
Our drafters brought personal photos and objects to assist their drawing. Here, our colleague Mish Kosumi draws the experience of waking up in one of the bedrooms with all meaningful photos to her in, in display. She drew without interrupting the flow of hand drawing, keeping the ink line continuous to represent a continuous presence of consciousness. On the left, you see a still of the recording, and on the right, the same drawing as scanned after completion. And here you see another drawing by Mishko showing the use of the bathrooms. An exciting aspect of this process was our social drawings, when we wanted to represent common areas of the Orchard Center, the breakfast room, for instance, occupied by many people, we thought that we should draw correspondingly as many um, architects. So drawing was a shared event, and all of us enacted the process of eating and of drawing simultaneously in an interactive way. We were interested in drawing as an activity rather than as an outcome. The finished drawing here, to draw the music room, we danced and listened to typical Irish tunes uh, that would be likely to be played in the building. And we recorded the sound of drawing itself, as we show here, because we wanted the final installation to contain aspects of the sonic reality of drawing. We drew the gardens. Lee Halligan here joined us to draw trees. And gradually, we started overlapping the finished drawings physically as well as digitally. Here you see overlapping drawings done by different authors. We wanted to capture divergent perspectives in conversation and thought that the multiplicity and translucency of many drawings could evoke a sense of, of the simultaneity of experiences. So each of the 64 sections of the building plan had to be drawn multiple times and by more than one drafters to represent different times and different occupants experiencing the building. The result was many hundreds of, of drawings. We determined special and temporal relationships between the individual recordings so that we could meaningfully assemble a new animated plan of the building. These are scores that also um, choreographed uh, the sonic aspects of the installation, and we worked with Kevin Pollard to do this. Um, more drawings that linked with uh, scores and scripts that we did in order to figure out how we would assemble all of these drawings to create uh, one whole uh, sequence. This drawing embodies the start of the day when inhabitants start to wake up, and the blank areas of the plan suggest areas of the building that are yet out of experience, out of consciousness. And this drawing assemblage pre presents a busy time at midday where all parts of the buildings have been occupied. Extended as a projection, this would reach about four, to four, by, five, four by six meters. The white edges between the drawings perhaps uh, create a kind of a ghost image of the original plan of the building. We also added uh, a hexagonal grid cells that related to the information we got from the neuroscientists that they indicate the brain activity when a room was occupied. And we also worked on evening sequences. So the slide shows here the gardens, while the grid cells on the edges indicate occupied interior rooms. And another fragment of an evening drawing. I will finish with this still of the totality of the drawing as assembled to represent midnight. Characters in the drawing are represented as full subjects, pursuing independently their ideas and speaking in ways other than the architect's original voice. And this plan now is no longer absorbed by a dominating monologue. It is not fixed or totalizing. 
It is a co collaboration of many minds and many hands. I'm just going to finish off quickly by showing those are the dreaded quad pods that Claire spoke about. We couldn't uh, put anything from the roof. Uh, this is a, this, the setup we did up in Middlesbrough to set the thing up. But now I'm just going to take you through the installation itself. This was the test for it, uh, working through that. Um, and then what I want to do is just show you the installation in Venice itself. So all the data came down onto the top of the quad pods, which gave you this kind of rain of speakers and data cables coming down from the roof, creating this drawing on the floor beneath you. So this is the sense of the drawing on the floor. It's a huge space, and you can't quite get a, 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 an experience of um, the, the, the sonic environment with 50 speakers making a sonic field, and then different parts of the building being active at different times. This is just giving you a sense of what the thing was like in the, in, in the space in Venice. I haven't got time to go through each, each of these in detail. We're moving through the day and getting a sense of how the building moves through the seasons, but also through the time of day. Uh, and giving you a sense of different kinds of activity in different parts of the building at different times of the day. Um, there's a film I was going to show you, but I think we haven't got time. I want to end and put this R16 lessons at the end of it, um, uh, just so that if, if it's something we're having a discussion, we can talk about those 16 lessons. So I'm going to skip over the film, if you don't mind, and just leave the 16 lessons open. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, three. We are monumentally over time, and um, it didn't matter because I didn't think anybody wanted to, wanted to stop you in mid-flow and wanted to get to the end of your presentations. Um, interesting to see the different kind of reflections and, and ways of thinking about design for dementia. Um, I want to ensure we've got a little bit of time for questions from the floor, and I have lots of questions myself, but um, we'll just do a couple of them. Um, without meaning to uh, sort of simplify what you're, what you're all saying too much, um, but conscious there are lots of designers in the room, perhaps you haven't uh, designed for the dementia before, do you think we might conclude that the starting point of designing for dementia is actually about not a memory map, because that's what's failing, but a flow of spaces with identifiable recognizable activities within them. So, um, for instance, when, we, when we're designing, we're always thinking about the journey through the building, that you come into a space and there's somebody to talk to, there's somewhere to sit, there's opportunities for social interaction, but it doesn't stop there. There's visual accessibility, you can see the garden beyond, you can see there's a seat in the garden, you can see there's some roses in the garden, and beyond the reception, perhaps you can see a living space with a fireplace and is that a good starting point for our designers out there, do we think? Um, it, yeah, it is. Um, because um, what, what you explained also is that, that people with, with dementia, they, they, they go their own way. And, um, and that doesn't make any sense sometimes for us. So you have to provide for all those um, activities who are uh, constantly popping up and then flowing, uh, floating away, and so that uh, to 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 address all those kind of needs for people who are, who want to wander around, for people who want to sit down the, uh, the whole day or listen to music or or just sit and and relax. So that that kind of uh, spaces you have to provide, um, and perhaps that doesn't make sense for us as an architect, because we want to make boxes for uh, sometimes. Well, hopefully we don't. We know better, but yes. And, and I think concentrating on personal ex sort of lifestyle choices means that the spaces we provide and the number of them is greater. And you touched on that. You touched on the danger of flexible spaces. And so I guess interior design is incredibly important for what we're doing. So that, a place, so that a room for eating is laid up for dining when the food's ready. And it, the, you don't move the tables away and try to do something later, but you move into another space and it's a garden room and there's a, doors are open and you can hear the birds and there's some, some seeds there and some pots there and anyone who likes gardening might just actively engage in that. Somebody else might hate gardening and just move on and yep. in the next room there's some music and there's space to dance. So 
my experience is that interior design is increasingly important and should be part of the discussion from the beginning. And sometimes it might look to us designers quite cluttered or quite kitschy, but it needs to actually uh, hark back the 20 years that you mentioned to something that somebody recognises. It's interesting that wandering is quite a common um, manifestation uh, of people with dementia. And when I did a post occupancy visit to the daycare centre that I designed, there was a woman who was wandering and she was moving around the walls. And um, I went across and asked her in a very gentle way what she was doing. And she said, I'm looking for the stairs. And we had gone to great trouble to make the whole building on one level. And I said, why are you looking for the stairs? She said, because all my things are upstairs. And one of the things I found about designing for dementia is that I think for people with dementia that the environment that they're currently in is always haunted by other places, um, and they conflate with each other. And it, to some extent, that sounds kind of hallucinogenic and very strange. But isn't it the same for all of us, in a way, that the relationship between memory, recollection, situation, and so on, that we're constantly ferrying between here and elsewhere? One of the things that we did in that building, which we put a lot of work into, was what we called our spatial daisy chain, which was that wherever you are, there's always something that you might remember that you can walk towards. And when you get to it, you'll be able to see something else that you might remember that you can walk towards. So you create a linked set of circumstances. And there were things like clocks and um, a fish tank or a birdcage or something that just had a kind of a memorable aspect to it that if you place them in different, in different ways it means that that continuous circulation can, can return you back to the world all the time. Yeah, I guess that's what, that's what I was meaning by a flow of spaces and visual accessibility so you never get kind of stuck in a room. Did this uh, point about um, the flow of movement and recognising personal objects it, um, we discussed it a lot in the various dialogues we had with people, but I remember also how Helen, for whom we talked about, uh, she talked about this in the city. So how when walking in the city, navigation in the city, uh, uh, she really wanted to see landmarks to understand where she needs to turn or to see the church on the corner or the, the bank on the other corner and signs. So it's quite interesting to think about this movement both, both internally in smaller spaces but also in, in the urban realm, how we help um, to design places by considering flow of movement and navigation but also landmarks. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of my other questions was about discussing the sort of well-known tension between um, safety of residents and preserving quality of life and the sort of spiritual existence that you mentioned, Neil. Um, you know, in, historically, as uh, dementia design goes, I think operators in particular and carers have been sort of preoccupied with health and safety and keeping people in this kind of fear that everybody's going to escape. Um, Whereas the, the hoop fight kind of turns that on its head and you're finding ways to get people out, out and about and into community, which is really exciting. But I, I wonder how much of, of the success of doing that is about design and how much of it is about society's understanding of dementia and support. And Wandering gardens that we, just, that we designed for the day centre in, in Dublin were absolutely destroyed by health and safety. The, the, the new managers came in and didn't want the users to go out into the building. They cut down the fruit trees in case somebody tripped over the fruit. Um, they cut down most of the large, lar lar large plants and they, could, they, they corralled them in, into quite a small space near the door where they could go out to smoke. That was the only reason they could go out to smoke. And that went all the way through. And I heard another care home manager who said something fantastic. She said, I believe in my client's right to make poor decisions on their own behalf should they want to. That's the essence of uh, it. And, and, and it's, uh, uh, what you often see is that it's about ticket lists of prevention and safety. Yeah. And it's not listening to people, to residents, to, to family. Because if we discuss for my father to say, OK, when he trips and falls down, and he lives perhaps two months less, is that a problem? But is, he has a meaningful life, so that's no problem for me. So you have to discuss and educate and, and um, uh, with, also with residents and tell what um, 
and discuss together what you want for your relatives. So that is very important. And uh, skip, in my opinion, all those ticket lists uh, because they, they make no sense. And having a, a good lot death of, is very important. A lot of them makes no sense. Having a good death is very important. It's very important, yeah. And do you think um, that perhaps assistive technology and kind of passive monitoring of where people are is going to really help with that so that yeah, without that, being too that, that, dependent? That is, that is um, why I think uh, you can open up the Hogewijk much more than we designed it 20 years ago. Yes. Because it's evolving, and that's what I told you, with, uh, with technology, you can help people also wandering around in cities or, or uh, city-like environments, outside their living environment. Yes, definitely. I hate the term wandering, by the way. I think people are actively walking because they're trying to find something rather than feeling lost. It is um, also about educa educating uh, the outside world, citizens, uh, so yes. to say. Yes, uh, definitely. And I, I mean, I worry about, I know that we all share the same value of home and perhaps would like residents with dementia to be able to stay at home. But in, you know, have we really got the kind of active communities and supportive neighbours that one needs to maintain social interaction at the level which is, is beneficial for well-being? And, and therefore, I think these developments of <coughs> specialist housing as a choice have, you know, remain so important. Um, we've got 10 minutes, and there's a roaming mic. I don't know if Margaret's there with the microphone, and if anyone has, has a question. Uh, well, I'm not an architect, I'm a geriatrician. <laughs> and about 20 or 30 years ago, there was a, a fashion for designing day centres and uh, residential uh, homes for demented uh, patients on a racetrack principle, like a donut. <laughs> so you could have the best combination of no obstruction, good vision, um, being able to move around freely, uh, obviously with certain side doors, and then with your excellent daisy chain um, concept, a little bit like Virgil's bucolic garden in the eclogues, um, and th they were happy spaces. Uh, what's happened to them now? Them now? I, think, I think people realise that if there's a donut that somebody's going to walk around all day, they could quickly become dehydrated and exhausted, and actually creating meaningful spaces where there's a purpose to being in the room would hopefully mean that that, that the resident, rather than the patient, is is continuing to sort of enjoy the spaces and and not not well, need a donut. That, that's a good guess, but it I think well, I think the donut the was case. more about the care delivery hmm. and the amount of walking that the carers did um, than the residents themselves. But maybe you and what's agree. the best evidence base for the best design? Do you want to comment? I'd Thank you. Uh, if I, I understand your remarks correct, um, what, what, what we uh, try to do is not to, to design a track for people because of they wander around, but uh, create an environment where if one is going to wander around, see some interesting things, see some landmarks, see some activities, and go over there, and uh, because they wander around, yes, of course, but not, um, not constantly the same uh, round and round and round. You want to, uh, they have to relax, they have to sit, they have to watch people, uh, etc. So there is still uh, that kind of circuit, uh, if you like, but it's more natural and it's, uh, it's not designed as a circuit, but it's designed as normal life. So, in my opinion, that's where it is about. And, and most designs have, a, have lots of lovely circuits, but they, they come indoors and then they go outside and they might be under little covered walkways and um, come back in again. But um, just before we take another question, I suppose the other thing about doing a big loop around a racetrack type plan, and you know, I've seen many of them, is that you can't then break the community down into the lovely family-sized clusters 
uh, like the Hoogvig, which is in clusters of six, you, you would have that family member walking through other people's little clusters, which I think could be quite uh, disruptive and confusing for the people that are kind of trying to live in, in a little family size group. I think it's important listening to these conversations that for the audience here, I think there's a difference between the kind of designs that you do for end of life care, for residential care, for day care, and for respite care. Yep. And they, it's not just that they're different to each other, but they interact differently yep. to each other. Yes. One of the problems that we had is it's actually quite difficult to do respite care and day care together because the people who are staying and the people who are going get distressed. So there are a lot of nuances around this. There isn't one right answer or one wrong answer. It's, it's about a continuum and to provide all those stages uh, where, uh, and, and sometimes they over, overlap these stages. And uh, so it's, it's not a dedicated house uh, for, for stage two, three, and four, uh, or five, six, and seven. Um, that is not the outside world uh, where we live in, uh, and neither. So it's, you have to provide all those options. And that is very interesting. It's not one size fits all. It is a, it's a continuum. OK, I'm being told we're over time. Can we, Margaret, we can take maybe one more question? Thank you. Uh, my approach to my, the, 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 the kind of the architecture that I'm involved in um, uh, is, is predicated on allowing people to move. I design railway stations particularly. Um, and listening and hearing the things that you've been um, <laughs> working on for the last 10, 20 years is quite interesting because we're trying to do that now for buildings which will be built and operating in 15 years' time. And I was just wondering, what if you just had one thing to say about how you would, uh, what, what you would want to see in a transport piece of transport infrastructure from the from the lessons that you've learned doing the build your resi the particularly residential buildings, what would it be? Um, transport. Well, yeah. The question is about transport infrastructure. Yes, that's what I, well, that's, yeah. I mean, that's what I design. I, I wouldn't, I, 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 I wouldn't, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have an answer of that uh, outside of coming back to the point of um, um, educating um, citizens and, and everybody who works um, with, for example, public infrastructure, <coughs> uh, 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 so that um, rather than thinking that this is the job only of the planners or of the architects, to start thinking that this is a much more collaborative, a much more collaborative effort is required. And uh, part of that effort is not only related to specialist designers, but also to informing communities and citizens and everybody who works, for example, with public um, uh, public transport or, or um, anything else in the city. Just that's a point. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, obviously, there's lots you can do around amazing signage and clear visibility and um, you know, <coughs> different, me different ways of understanding where to be with voice uh, announcements. And you, know, you, can, you can work with Stirling University and other organizations to, to help with that. But I would agree with. But I think there's a bigger question in that, which is one of the curious things about designing specialized environments for people with dementia is that you always have this feeling in the back of your mind that it's a very curious thing to take a group of people with dementia and corral them all into the same building. It, there's, there's something almost coercive about that as, a, as, a, as an idea. What is it that they have in common with each other except that they have dementia, which none of them want to have? And there they all are together, arguing about which kind of music they want to listen to or whatever it is. It, 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 it is quite a negative idea. And in some better version of the world, the whole city would be dementia friendly. And my good friend, whose father died during COVID, he had dementia. And he lived in a small town. And when he left his flat, he'd go to the pub for lunch. And the first thing the landlord would do is ring the pub down the road to see if he'd had lunch there already. It's a really simple thing. But they're in communication with each other. But people in airports, people in train stations, bus drivers, uh, people in supermarkets, 
Um, you know, Helen carries a little badge saying, I have dementia, I'm getting on fine, but sometimes I can be a bit, you know, she, she has a little badge that says that. So if she's confused or lost, that people can pick up on that. And there's a way in which, even in our school education, if we, if we, if we trained each other uh, to actually think of the city as being something which is for all of us, and if architects began to think about, there isn't a specialized environment you design for dementia. If you're an architect, every single environment you design should be for people with dementia. And to think about the basic, the basic credentials. So if you look at all the specialist advice you get for, de for, for design centers with dementia, you can apply them to airports, you can apply them to train stations, and you know, it's, you're, you're designing good environments. Or, or you design uh, for people in wheelchairs, for people with the Down syndrome, for people who, who know their way in the city very good and people who are very blind with, with all those maps. And so, so you have to design for everybody. It's an inclusive designing society. And that's, you, you, told, uh, you just mentioned the whole world is like a dementia village. And that is why we still um, use our name dementia village because it's, it's, it's a statement now, because the whole world is like a dementia village, or a village Simple. with people with some other disabilities. So that there is no difference. So the, that continuum is very interesting. Yeah, we have this difference of um, v visible or non-visible um, disability. Helen, for example, gave us this example: arriving at the airport, um, and. And, and she's presented with a wheelchair where she can walk perfectly. She doesn't need a wheelchair. Is it a badge? Yeah. And, his, and she says to the, to, to the guy, oh, my brain is a little bit slow. My feet, my legs are OK. I can walk fast. <laughs> so there is this mis misconception. Yeah. And the, we need so much collaboration with everybody and uh, everybody to be much more informed. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think it's probably time to, to wrap up. Um, it just remains for me to sincerely thank um, our speakers, such amazing presentations, and the RIBA for inviting us and Avitra for sponsoring. As you say, we must keep on talking about dementia and continue to understand how we can provide buildings and gardens and public realm which are ever more inclusive to people with dementia. It's not going to ostracize anyone else. It's just good practice. Um, Neil and your year, I kind of wish that we could rename your project Finding Myself Again instead of Losing Myself because I think if we really do understand how space is perceived and we understand all the tricks to avoid ever getting lost, then we ought to put a bit of a positive spin on it and rename it Finding Myself. Frank, I wish you every luck in the world with all of your future villages and the exciting ideas you presented. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.